Father in heaven, we thank you so much for an opportunity to hear from you on this topic which will touch many lives and hit many of us in areas of our hearts and our souls that we need attention. And so, Father, I pray that you would, would convict but also encourage and give us hope in this area of overcoming the lust of the eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to the seminar entitled Faith Over Flesh. It was about two years ago that I was finishing up the Media on the Brain content. In Media on the Brain, we talk about advertising, we talk about Hollywood, the music industry, Madison Avenue, all of these things. But one of the things that we touch on just a little bit is, is the pornography industry. But even two years ago when I saw this topic, I said, that one right there stands out from the rest in deserving its own complete total treatment. We need to analyze this as, as a seminar in itself. And so having taken some time to do that, you know, I thought maybe I was going to come out with a, you know, a, a session or two on the topic instead of just a portion of media on the brain. But this topic has ballooned before my very eyes as I have studied deeply into the pornography addiction topic, how the brain works, principles for healing and recovery and overcoming. This thing ballooned into a six part seminar. It's entitled A Greater Lust. So what you're going to be hearing is a few of the highlights, about two hours in our two sessions here, which will summarize many of the important insights from the full six part series called A Greater Lust. So we're calling these sessions Faith Over Flesh. And if you want overcoming, if you want principles and, and strategies and actual, an actual game plan for how to move forward and gain victory over the lust of the eyes, much of that DVD series will include that. We're going to start here though, looking at your brain. Your brain is only 2% of your body's weight, but it uses 20% of the body's energy. So do you realize what that means? The brain is using 10 times more energy than the rest of the body. It's only 2% of the body's weight, but it's using 20% of the body's energy. This is a very, very important area of the brain, not just that. Neur neurons propel messages through the brain circuits at 250 miles per hour. The scientists tell us that the brain is more complex than our entire solar system. The brain contains about 100 billion neurons, and if you look at each of these neurons, each one can have a possibility of connecting with thousands of other separate neurons. Now, it's been estimated by the, the brain scientists, they've said there is a possibility, the hypothetical possibility, that there could be over 40 quadrillion brain connections, neuron connections in the brain. Now, that is such an unfathomably large number, 40 quadrillion. How big is that? I couldn't even wrap my mind around that. So I did a little search to see what does 40 quadrillion actually look like. What they tell us is if you take dollar bills, and you place them on the surface of the earth one at a time, and you place them over the entire surface of the earth, including the water, one right next to another, line them all up, cover the whole earth. To get to 40 quadrillion bills, you would have to cover the entire surface of the earth 50 times, nearly 50 times. <laughs> it gets even more nutty than that. If you account for the, all the different possible electrochemical configurations of each of these 40 quadrillion possible connections, then what you're looking at is a number that is so far beyond what I can even comprehend. It would be 10 with 10 trillion zeros behind it. 10 with 10 trillion zeros behind it is the number of possible different configurations of these 40 quadrillion connections. Now explain that from an evolutionary standpoint. Evolutionary theory holds that evolution will only take place, advancements will only take place based upon survival of the fittest, based upon the needs and necessities that the species is facing, but our brains have supposedly evolved to be trillions of times more complex than we could ever use in a single lifetime. It's because our brains were created for eternity. We were meant to live, to live and grow and learn perpetually all these potential connections. And by the way, these are the numbers of what we know now. And so these will probably be, be revised. But let me sh share a quotation from Mind, per Character, and Personality. It says the brain nerves which communicate with the entire system are the only medium through which heaven can communicate to man and affect his inmost life. So not only is the brain the most powerful and complex and amazing organ, but also it is a spiritual organ. It is the only method whereby heaven can communicate with us, whereby God can communicate with us, which brings us to sexual addiction, because a powerful organ can become powerfully addicted. And we're going to look at how pornography affects the brain. 
When you see the depth of the problem in this session, it will not only call forth a sense of urgency of, whoa, this is what we've gotten ourselves into, but also the solution will be right hidden in the problem. It's incredible what you will see. Some very good news. But here's the depth of the problem. First of all, the studies tell us that only 13.9% of young adult males never view pornography. Now, if you're one of those 13.9% saying, yeah, I never view this stuff, maybe I don't need to watch this seminar. And the question is though, have you gained complete victory over the lust of the eyes? Even if it may not have pornographic content, it's something that virtually all men have struggled with and need to overcome completely. And ladies too, by the way, this is not just a seminar for men, it's mainly geared toward men, but women struggle with these things as well. And there will be overcoming principles, especially in the full seminar of A Greater Lust, that the, the overcoming principles that, that, that can be applied to anything, not just pornography and lust. But some more statistics and studies. One Canadian researcher attempted to launch a study on university age men. What he found was that the study couldn't even go forward because they couldn't find any college-age males who were, were not already using pornography. Now, he only overstated it slightly when he made this statement. He said, guys who do not watch pornography do not exist. Now, that's a slight overstatement, but the numbers are so overwhelming, they couldn't find anybody. We also see that this is a big problem in the church. 50% of Christian men admit in surveys to being addicted to pornography. 54% of Christian pastors have viewed pornography in the previous year. And these are the ones that admit it in surveys. So you can imagine that these understate the case quite significantly. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other research, 70% of men admit that, the, that they struggle with it. So 50% say they're addicted to it. What does the Bible have to say about this? The Greek word porneia is normally translated as fornication, but certainly we could apply that here to the issue we're discussing. Porneia, in Matthew 5, 15, 19, it says that porneia proceeds from the heart. Because Jesus taught in Matthew 5 that you can actually commit adultery even in your mind by just lusting after a woman who is not your wife. 1 Corinthians 6, 18 says we are to flee from porneia, just as Joseph literally ran away from Potiphar's wife who was trying to seduce him. Flee from porneia. 1 Corinthians 6.18 also says that by practicing porneia, you are sinning against your own body. So if you think about it, sexual sin is really just a form of self-abuse. You may have heard that euphemism used for masturbation before. Self-abuse, it's harming your own body. We're going to see how in the brain in a moment. 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says we should abstain from porneia. Abstain, obviously, completely. Revelation 9 verse 21 explains that those who receive the plagues in the last days include, among other things, users of porneia. In Revelation 17 and 18 and 19, we see porneia is used as an analogy for the infidelity of false religion or known as Babylon. Now, uh, the majority of men struggling with this, how did we get here? You know, this really has been a deliberate plan. This is not something that just happens by accident, just like the media agenda, the agenda within schooling that we've studied. This is something that the devil has had a deliberate plan to bring as his ace card, as his last day's deception. And I'll tell you the history of that. Let's go back to Numbers 25. Remember what happened in the history of God's people, Israel. In Numbers 25, the Israelites were just on the borders of the, of the Canaan that they that God had promised them and that they were heading toward. And, and, and the, the king, the local king in the area, Balak, saw this danger of these people coming in. And so he hired Balaam to curse the Israelites, curse these people. And it didn't work, right? Balaam only blessed them three times. So then Satan brings out his strategy number two. Send in the Moabite women. Send in the temptress and the Israelite men were completely won over by this and started to practice idolatry and worship in the Moabite temples. And commit porneia with the Moabite women. And so just while they were on the borders of the Canaan, they were just about to be there, and this came in and just stole them away. Same thing today. Listen to this from the Review and Herald. The very same Satan is now working to weaken and destroy the people who are just on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Satan knows it is his time. He has but little time left now in which to work. And he will work with tremendous power to ensnare the people of God upon their weakest points of character. They will, there will be women who will become tempters and who will do their best to attract and win the attention of men to themselves. And of course, this has been fulfilled in the last 130 years. Since that statement was made, we've seen that prediction be fulfilled perfectly. Have there been tempters? Has Satan brought in sexual temptation while God's people are on the borders of the heavenly Canaan, just like when Israel was?
So let's look at that history. The man you see on the screen is Alfred Kinsey. He is the founder of the sexual revolution in American history, which took place in the 1960s. Not just that, but he is the author of Sexual Behavior in the Human Male and Sexual Behavior in the Human Female, known as the Kinsey Reports. These were the standard texts. These were the, the dogma of human sexuality in academic circles, and they were absolutely based upon research fraud. And there, you could do so much history on Kinsey. He, he, he was using, doing studies on things that I don't even want to mention, so it, you could actually get into trouble just, just studying this man and his history. It's so disgusting. But he agreed with his wife that both of them would practice sexual promiscuity outside of their marriage, including homosexuality. Uh, he was the most significant figure in what you might say is normalizing immoral sexuality. And it, tragically, this preacher of sexual, rebel, sexual deviation and, 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 for, and liberty, sexual liberation, he died at an early age. And this is biblical as well. It says that those who practice sexual immorality receive the due penalty of their perversion. This is not some arbitrary decree. He was a very sad individual into all of this. And what we actually see in the history is something very interesting. Guess who read and studied Kinsey's material? None other than Hugh Hefner, the founder of Playboy, the founder of the pornography movement in America. And he said, I will be Kinsey's pamphleteer. So the movement began with Kinsey, and Kinsey is so important in this, I want to use a comparison. Kinsey is to the movement of pornography as Darwin is to the movement of Darwinism or, or, or evolutionary theory. And if you think about these two, they're quite similar in a certain way. Kinseyism, or, or, or the sexual deviation, the sexual revolution, preaches that, that, that you can do what you want to do, and basically the human, human organism can behave like an animal. This is why the bunny, right? Well, what does Darwinism teach? That we are just evolved animals too, right? Where Darwinism reduces, eliminates the creator, Kinseyism reduces and demeans the created, which is the image of God. And so these two, this is Satan's two-pronged approach in the last days. Eliminate the creator and debase the created, both of which reduce us to the level of an animal and mar the image of God in man, which is his main agenda on this earth, right? Now, if you look at your own personal history, you know, it's easy to talk about the history of the sexual revolution, but maybe you're personally struggling. Or, or maybe you haven't looked at inappropriate things for quite some time. You know, maybe it's been months or, or even, even, even a year. But most men, the majority of men, can't, almost all men, cannot point to a two to five period, two to five year period of time in their life where they've been completely free from sexually debasing practices and, and, and lust. And if that's not the case, if, if we are slaves to lust, remember, this is preventing us from walking into heaven across the heavenly Canaan, the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Now, there is one last statistic, though. I've given you some pretty negative statistics. Man, 54%, 50%, 70%, 83%. Well, the statistic that hasn't been compiled yet, I can't wait to see it, is that there are more men now, I am convinced, there are more men now recovering from pornography addiction and lustful addictions than at any time in history. Because it came in like a flood after the 1990s. Everybody's got internet access. Everybody's got Wi-Fi, all these videos. And today, there are people, even in non-religious circles, who are saying, I've had enough of this addiction. I want freedom from this. And especially religious people who know the time, the urgency of the time in which we live. They're saying, I've had enough. I want a real solution. So I'm here to tell you that lust is not inevitable. And this seminar will present shockingly high levels of hope so not just the lurid statistics and the, the depressing reality of the status quo. As an individual, forget about the statistics. You can be freed. So let's move forward. Why is it so hard to stop? You've probably tried hard to stop. Maybe you don't even, probably you don't even believe in doing these sins. You don't want to be doing these sins, but you just can't help but do it, it feels. And the reason for this is that there have been actual structural changes in the brain. Through repeated pornography use, repeated masturbation, you see in mind, character, and personality that moral principle is exceedingly weak when it conflicts with established habit. So you can have moral principles that are as solid as a rock. I believe in perfect purity. But if you have established habit, you know what? Those principles become weak. And I'll show you why in the brain. What you see on the screen is a SPECT scan of a normal brain. SPECT means a single photon emission computerized tomography. Take a look at the normal brain versus the pornography-addicted brain. 
you can actually see visible damage and weakened areas of the brain that are less functioning or not functioning entirely, particularly in the frontal area. Now, that, now we're going to show you from the bottom of the brain. That's the bottom, and that's a cocaine addict. See all the holes and damage, and man, this, this brain's really had a number done on it. That's a pornography user's brain from the bottom. Even worse than a cocaine addict. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.18 says that he who sins sexually sins against his own body. This is what we're seeing, actual damage. You know, in, in, in 1 Corinthians 3.17, when it says that if you destroy the temple of God, that you are going to be destroyed, this is that in action. It is being destroyed through these behaviors. That's why we use the word addiction. We use the word addiction because it is a real addiction. Dr. Jeffrey Satinover says, modern science allows us to understand that the underlying nature of an addiction to pornography is chemically nearly identical to a heroin addiction. Wow. The way the brain reacts to pornography is nearly identical on a chemical level as a heroin addiction. Also, we read from Dr. Judith Reisman that pornography triggers a myriad of endogenous internal natural drugs that mimic the high from a street drug. Addiction to pornography is addiction to what I dub erototoxins, mind-altering drugs produced by the viewer's own brain. And somebody might say, you know, I haven't viewed it in a long time. It's been like my nine months. And, and you know what? Over the past few years, maybe three or four times. Do we say that about heroin or cocaine? You know, the, pornography is not healthy in any dose. And this is so drug-like, it's, it's mimicking exactly what a drug ha does in your brain. And if you allow the devil to have that little toehold in your life, just, just, you know what, I've only seen it a couple of, I've only, you know, it's not a big problem for me, it's not a big habit, it's only the occasional thing. You know what, <laughs> numerous studies have shown that pornography's ability to totally, what the scientists call hypnotize, totally enrapture and capture the mind, overwhelming the ability to make wise decisions, this stuff is not something you want to mess with because if he gets that toehold in your life, he'll dig right in and you become completely captive to these images. By the way, the book Adventist Home uses the term witchcraft to describe lust or licentiousness. It's a species of witchcraft. It's bewitching in a very real sense. And this is why we read that the controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands. So this could be the appetite for food, or it could be the appetite for sexual things. This is the fleshly lust. Let's read on. It will prove the ruin of thousands when, if they had conquered on this point, they would have had the moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation of Satan. But those who are slaves to appetite will fail in perfecting Christian care. The continual transgression of man for 6,000 years has brought sickness, pain, and death as its fruits. And as we near the close of time, Satan's temptations to indulge appetite will become more powerful and more difficult to overcome. Was that prophecy fulfilled today or what? Are Satan's temptations of food and sexual lust more difficult to overcome today? He's gotten very sophisticated. And so we're going to look deeply into the brain now. Let's describe the actual neurological process of lust. You may have heard of the process of stress. It's called the stress cascade. We're going to call this the lust cascade, okay? The first thing about the brain that happens with a sexual desire takes place in the hypothalamus. This area is a hardwired area of the brain. That's the drive centers of the brain. So the desire for food, for water, for sexual desires, all are rooted right there in the hypothalamus. By the way, isn't it interesting that Jesus said that at the time before the flood, Men were marrying, eating, drinking, and marrying and giving in marriage. Eating, drinking, and sexual things, which is part of the marriage, right? And, and, and these were intemperate marriages. These were the daughters of, of God, the sons of God were looking at the daughters of men. Ooh, we like them. And so they, they were marrying based upon their, their personal preferences and, and their desires rather than what is wise and proper. So sex, food, and, and drink, what was, that's what was going on before the flood. And then Jesus says in Matthew 24, as in the days of Noah so also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Men were eating, drinking, marrying, and giving in marriage. Why does he mention those three together? Well, we now know scientifically. The hypothalamus is that internal drive center that says, that's good, that's good, that's good. And by the way, these are survival things, and, and sexuality is a part of you know, procreation, a part of God's design for intimacy. So these things aren't bad in themselves. But if they are controlling desires, if, the, if they are like they were at the time of the flood, intemperate, then we have a problem. But here's the thing. The desire itself is not 
bad, sinful, wrong. It's hardwired in the hypothalamus, okay? So don't go, oh, why am I attracted to members of the opposite sex? Or why do I, why do I look at food and want to eat it when it's not mealtime? You know, it's the initial desire is not sin. It's what we do with that, that, that we're, we're going to look at the whole lust cascade process. But just remember, the hypothalamus, God has given this to us for a reason. He wants us to enjoy good food. He wants us to practice sexuality in its proper context and enjoy the wife of our youth. But here's where we go from there. Once the eyes lock on to an image, the first place that that image stops is called the LGN. So when you see that billboard, you see that image, that magazine, that screen, the image on the computer, within the thalamus is the LGN. This is also hardwired and not very plastic. By, by the way, by plastic we mean changeable. We mean the neurons can be rerouted and you can, you can gain some self-control. Not so with this very, very first area. This is a part of the experience within the brain that says that's good. It's kind of like when you see that tasty dessert, right? The initial, oh, you notice it, of course you're going to notice it, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. The brain says that's good, but then you get to decide what happens next. And that's in the visual cortex, the occipital lobe. So step two, after it stops along the LGN as a stopping point, this is where we process the image visually. Actually, right in the back of the brain here is the occipital lobe, and the eyes take that image in, or you imagine it. If you're imagining it, it's the same thing. You're visualizing or you're seeing. There is occipital lobe activity. This is a place where we can have some control, isn't it? Because you can choose. You know, that millisecond moment where the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and the LGN go, that's good. You can choose to say, oh yeah, it is good, and I want to continue to behold things that are not healthy and reasonable and right and, and beneficial and God-glorifying. Or you can bounce those eyes right at this point. We'll get more onto that in just a second. But once you're engaged now, once you've got the occipital lobe going off and you're, you're enjoying and delighting and taking, beholding this image, the lust cascade is in gear. It's kind of like the gas pedal has been pressed on your car and you're heading right down a highway and there are high containment walls on each side of that highway. That's the neural pathway in your brain that is going on. And there are a few off ramps from this highway, by the way, where you've gotten on and you're hitting the gas pedal. Now the brakes, let's use the analogy, okay? The brakes are the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex is where you can make the decision to say no to something. The prefrontal cortex is where you can control impulses. Now here's the amazing thing, back to the slide. The physiological process that is engaged, if you're going down the lust cascade, the heartbeat increases to 100 beats per minute. At that point, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. Cortisol and norepinephrine have been released and you are in survival reactive mode. So that's why I say it's like a highway with very few off ramps because you are just boom, zoned in and the, the primitive centers of the brain, these more deep emotional desirous centers are just engaged and on fire and the occipital lobe is taking it all in. 100 beats per minute is the point where the prefrontal cortex starts to shut down. So the heart rate goes up and then something else is happening. When you are viewing this material or viewing an image, even just for a couple of seconds, it releases testosterone into the bloodstream, which is priming the body for sexual action. Now, the real unfortunate thing about this is once you've taken that few seconds to entertain that thought or view that image, the testosterone release has happened and it takes a while for this wave of testosterone to, to subside. So if we're inviting these things, we're just getting this wave after wave, a tsunami of testosterone, it's going to be more likely leading to sexual misbehavior because we've invited this upon us. Step four, <clears throat> as you've beheld that image or thought for more than that millisecond, the drive tension of the hypothalamus increases and this causes an extremely important step, what's called the amygdala is agitated. Amygdala agitation. Now, the amygdala is are also the is also the, the center of, of fear and, and anxiety, and, and also this 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 sexual tension. So, when the amygdala is on fire, it's clamoring and for and demanding a response. It's saying, "Must do something. Must do something." So, the amygdala is just inflamed. It's just going. It's going and going and going because you've beheld, you've invited. The testosterone's going off. Prefrontal cortex is off. 100 beats per minute, and the amygdala is saying, "Let's do something with this." Well, step five. Usually men relieve the amygdala agitation through masturbation. This releases enormous quantities of dopamine and endogenous opiates. The pleasure reward center of the nucleus accumbens and the cingulate cortex are stimulated, just the same as with substance abuse. And then upon ejaculation, the amygdala immediately are calmed. Anxiety and tension is released. So the amygdala clamored for it, and they got it. And this is the lust cascade that, that men are struggling with in such great degree. 
Now, what is the result of this? The next step is that norepinephrine burns that initial arouser into the memory to call it up at a later time. So the brain says, ooh, that was a very meaningful experience that I just had. This was very pleasurable. And the area of the brain is called the salience network. It's where it defines what is good and helpful and something worth remembering, something significant. That's what salience means. And so it, it defines what's important and good. We want more of that. So that initial arouser, the associations, the triggers are burned into the brain. And the brain, when it sees those again, says, ooh, this again, let's do that. This was a physiologically and emotionally significant event. Well, how do you stop the lust cascade from happening? That's the big question, right? Well, it's as simple as this. Don't look for more than that millisecond. Don't look a second time. Bounce those eyes immediately off of that. But many porn users have tried, many, many, many lust addicts have tried I am going to not look. I'm going to, I'm going to grip my teeth and try really hard. And you're know, trying really hard has, has just failed epically, right? And, and there's a reason for that. I, I want to do a little experiment with you right now. Try not to think about a donkey with a pink ribbon in her hair. Now, that's a silly example because now everybody has the image of a donkey with a pink ribbon in their hair. So if you, try, if you say, I'm going to try not to think about something, you're thinking about that something, right? Jesus said that if a demon is cast out of a man and is not, the house is not filled, if it's just swept clean and put in order, the demon will get seven more demons more wicked than himself and go and occupy that house. So the message is, be sure to fill the mind with other things. Be sure to bounce those eyes and, and reflect upon something high and holy, to do other things physically, to not try not to think about it. In fact, if you're trying to overcome a, a habit of any kind, an addiction, don't view it so much as, I am going to stop doing this. If you view it as ceasing doing something, then the something is what you're still thinking about, right? Say, this is what I'm going to do instead. We need to be rerouting these neural pathways into other things. And if we don't do that, if we just try not to, it's going to fail. Immediately fill the mind with something else. Now, also, you need to be able to calm down. And one way that you can calm down is correct breathing. So that image pops up, you bounce the eyes, fill the mind with other things. By the way, there's three hours of solutions, so I'm giving you just like brief tidbits here, but there is a whole lot more to be said about other things you can fill the mind with, some strategies and techniques. But one of those techniques is take a deep breath, a very good deep breath. Proper breathing is something we don't do in our high-paced, high-stress society. We don't have proper respiration. And that's problematic because it makes it so that the brain does not function properly. When the brain doesn't have proper oxygen, the prefrontal cortex isn't going to be as good at uh, hit those brakes, let's, let's make a good decision here, let's exercise self-control. So that oxygen really feeds into the prefrontal cortex. But also the oxygen does something else. A good respiration soothes the nerves, we read in Ministry of Healing, page 272. Soothes the nerves. This is so fascinating. This is scientifically accurate from over 100 years ago. There's a little nerve in the back of your neck called the dorsal vagal nerve. And when you take a deep breath, that nerve is calmed. Or in Ministry of Healing's words, soothed. So what we heard from the distant past now, we see is scientifically accurate. Take that deep breath. And, and practicing proper breathing is not necessarily something you need to do in order to get into, uh, this is not Eastern meditation that we're talking about. You can have the mind filled with things, not emptying the mind, but you're still breathing properly. And we, we, we forget to do that. So set a, sometimes my wife and I, when we're working at home, we'll set our phone every hour to have that phone go off and remind us, hey, have you gone an hour? Have you gone a significant amount of time with, with just stress or, or, or worries or, or, or forgetting Jesus? Spend some time in prayer. Don't make sure you don't go an hour without any thoughts of God. And so if you have those times of prayer, use those times also to make sure that you are breathing properly and getting that good oxygen in, okay? And this is, again, this is not New Age meditation, but this is something very physiological and spiritual as we contemplate God and think about Him. So addiction is about the structural change in the brain that has taken place. And if that's the case, the key to freedom then will be to have new structural change, new pathways to replace the old. Now, that's just a little window into a bunch more that I have on solutions on a greater lust. But let me give you a quotation from Dr. Struthers in his book, Wired for Intimacy. He says, if this corrupted pathway can be avoided, a new pathway can be formed. We can establish a healthy sexual pattern where the flow is redirected toward holiness rather than corrupted intimacy. 
By intentionally redirecting the neurochemical flow, the path toward right thinking becomes the preferred path and is established as the mental habit. By deepening the holiness pathways, we are freed from deciding what to do is right and good as they become part of our embodied nature. So literally, the old brain is being replaced by a new one, a whole new series of thoughts and connections, a new brain map, if you will. And the beauty of this, by the way, I, I can testify to this in my own life. You know, Scott Ritzema is not a recovering pornography addict, but as a male in our society, growing up with the imprint of what sexuality is all about that is so warped, so distorted that you get from the culture around you and your peers, you, you have a struggle, right? And I can say that today, when I, you know, I'm driving down the highway or in the airport, and this is, of course, only God's grace, that I can say the statement from Spirit of Prophecy that says, if you are allowing God to work in your life, your weakest points of character can become your strongest. The holiness pathway is just like firm in this area, not because I have done anything, but I can say guys who are going, no way, this is just impossible. This talk about being sexually pure is never going to happen. It can, and it does. Where you bounce those eyes, and you, you, you have a, a distaste, that you're, you're, you get a little bit angry with the enemy for assaulting you in this way. And that's part of the strategy, too. You say, no, thank you, and fill that mind with something else. And you will have part of your embodied nature, the holiness pathways becoming stronger and stronger. And here's the promise. If the brain is powerful enough to get you addicted to a behavior, then it's just as powerful to get you, quote, addicted to a new behavior. A new thought life, completely new, transformed by the renewing of our minds. Listen to this from Mind, Character, and Personality. If Christ be the theme of contemplation, the thoughts will be widely separated from every subject which will lead to impure acts. The mind will strengthen by dwelling upon elevating subjects. If trained to run in the channel, that's an interesting phrase, by the way. Run in the channel. This is neurologically accurate. Now, we know that there are channels or pathways, neurological circuits within the brain. Back to the quote. If trained to run in the channel of purity and holiness, it will become healthy and vigorous. If trained to dwell upon spiritual themes, it will naturally take that turn. But this attraction of the thoughts to heavenly things cannot be gained without the exercise of faith in God as an earnest, humble reliance upon him for that strength and grace which will be sufficient for every emergency. Another quote from Mind, Character, and Personality, we read, All are free moral agents, and as such they must train their thoughts to run in the right channel. The first work of those who would reform is to purify the imagination. Our meditations should be such as will elevate the mind. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Here is a wide field in which the mind can safely range. There's a lot of freedom of the mind. God said to Adam and Eve, you can eat from any tree in the garden. Just that one, watch out for and so much of life in God's world is freedom. When you find out that the tree you've been obsessed with and you can't help but go back to, and you think that's everything because that's all you know and your brain is totally accustomed to only going there, all of a sudden, once you're freed from that, you go, man, life is way better. There's so much more joy, so much more peace, so much more fun out in the rest of God's world with this safely wide range that he's given us for our thoughts to go. Another quotation from Mind, Character, and Personality. If Satan seeks to turn the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back. When corrupt imaginings seek to gain possession of your mind, flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. By the grace of Christ, it is possible for us to reject impure thoughts. Jesus will attract the mind, purify the thoughts, and cleanse the heart from every secret sin. Secret sin, by the way, is a euphemism for the behavior we're talking about here. Reading on. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you see, every thought can be taken captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's a promise. This is not something I work out in my own strength. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that God will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but He will provide a way out. We also read from Romans 6, 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? So you could actually be a slave to righteousness. 
I, I want to be impulsively obedient. I want to get to the point where when I am doing the Lord's will, I am but carrying out my own impulse. And since our minds are so habituated, so habitual, so prone to habit, good or bad, that is good news for greater victories, for a more habitual obedience. Now, I want to show you something on the screen right now. You see a healthy control group on the left and a drug abuser brain on the right. Notice the middle part of the healthy control group, the dark orange portions. What those are are the pleasure centers within the brain. The darker portions symbol, represent more activity. And so within a healthy brain, there's a lot of pleasure. Simple pleasures in life take place and that area fires off. Now look back at that one on the right. You notice it's not much orange there. The drug abuser does not find much pleasure in life. It's the same thing whether you're a video game addict or a pornography addict or whatever. The normal pleasures of life begin to be dull. Life as God designed it begins to be uninteresting. And we start needing to go back to that other thing in order to get any pleasure in life. But the good news is, once you become a slave to righteousness, this is the kind of change that can happen. You see a methamphetamine user in the middle, one month from coming off of his drug. But look at 14 months of abstinence from his drug. The orange has returned, just as in the healthy control brain, and those pleasure centers are lighting up again, and he's starting to find happiness, peace, and joy. Dopamine is being released in his brain now from things like delayed gratification and intellectual stimulation, accomplishing difficult tasks, whatever it might be. We're rebuilding the brain's pleasure and motivation centers. And so as you come off of this, as you come into a new brain, a completely new life, this is your renewed brain, the way the brain is supposed to look. And listen to this one too from Wired for Intimacy. Dr. Struthers tells us, imagine that you could be neurologically enslaved to purity rather than porn. Enslaved to seeing the dignity of each individual rather than their utility to you. The process of sanctification is an addiction to holiness, a compulsive fixation on Christ, and an impulsive pattern of compassion, virtue, and love. For the full seminar, A Greater Lust, I gave it the subtitle, Enslaved to Purity in a Pornographic World. Enslaved to purity in a pornographic world. We can be in these last days when the devil has this final last ditch temptation. When we're on the borders of the heavenly Canaan, he comes in, I'm going to bring the Moabite women in. This is the very, very ace card to capture these men's souls. Right in the midst of the most pornographic world in the history of our earth, you can be enslaved to purity. So I encourage you to view not only the entirety of A Greater Lust, but stick around for session two of Faith Over Flesh. You're going to see some incredible revelations from modern science, from the Bible, from the spirit of prophecy. And I want to close in prayer as I think about the many souls who are struggling with this. God does not come at you with condemnation, with, with heaping shame upon you. But that initial guilt that you, that you feel, take that to God. And we'll talk about guilt and shame in the second session and what to do with these feelings of, of self, self-worth and, and how to find forgiveness and how to find victory. So let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your grace and mercy. We thank you that you have promised us victory. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, I know that there are many struggling souls. There are many who, who, who feel just like failures. And Father, I pray that you would just affirm their humanity, that they are children of you, that they have been adopted into your kingdom, and that they will overcome by your grace. Father, I thank you so much for the peace that you give to each one of us. And I pray for that peace for every soul who is struggling. In Jesus' name.